Good morning and welcome to EACS in Vienna. We are delighted to be here today to bring you this roundtable discussion on wound management. My name is Jill Lay. I'm a clinical nurse specialist from California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. And I'm delighted to be joined today by my panelists, Melissa Rashon. Melissa is a C clinical nurse specialist with the surveillance team from the Royal Brompton and Harefield. Uh, Dr. Teresa Kieser, cardiothoracic surgeon from the University of Calgary, Canada, and Richard Van Valen, a nurse practitioner from Erasmus in the Netherlands. All of these presenters will be speaking later on today on the topic of wound management, and we wanted to give you a preview of what they'll be saying today. So we thought we would begin with Dr. Kieser uh, to give us her um, uh, a little preview of what she'll be talking about so that we can learn from a surgeon about how to manage wounds uh, optimally. Dr. Kieser. Thank you, thank you, Jill. Uh, as you said earlier, as, the, as we are the creator of the problem <laughs> and the wounds, it's good to have a plan. Um, I think the single most message that I want to get out there is that infection does not happen from a light handle dropping from the ceiling. It happens from a multiple of, of factors that have been transgressed to prevent infection, like, uh, like the, uh, the patient's uh, obesity, the diabetes. Uh, your surgical technique was left a lot of bit of a scar, and, uh, not scar, uh, eschar in the wound mm -hmm. for the bugs to love, uh, and the light handle dropped from the ceiling. So, and by to prevent wound infection, one must pre um, add layers of prevention to this. So now, for example, skeletonization of the internal mammary artery. Um, don't ever use bone wax. Uh, use vancomycin bone paste instead right at the end of the procedure. Uh, use, your, use chlorhexidine alcohol instead of betadine. This has definitely been proven. These factors all help build up layers so that you can get a, towards zero infection rate with your patients obviously a goal that we're all, we're all working very hard towards, but unfortunately it doesn't always work out that way. And uh, Melissa, I believe you can offer some information about what you're doing to uh, manage these wounds as well. Thank you, Jill. So I'm delighted this morning to come along and present on the photo at Discharge. This is an initiative to take a picture of the wound on the day the patient goes home, to give that picture to the patient and carer so that they act as a link between acute and community care. With this scheme, we've been able to demonstrate a significant reduction in readmissions, which I'll be presenting later on today. And in my second session, we'll be wading into a bit of controversy. Um, our experience with skin prep solution, as well as with sternal wound swabbing, um, and what th those issues have had an impact on uh, wound healing as well. Okay, I'll come back to that in just a moment. And uh, Richard, uh, you're going to be speaking about negative pressure therapy today. Uh, will you give us a little uh, preview of what you'll be discussing? Of course. Negative pressure has been used for quite a, uh, many years now for complex wounds after cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, but in the last couple of years, we've been working towards applying it in high-risk patients. And when we're talking about applying layers to protect those patients, it's also important to detect those patients who are at risk. So the extreme obese patients, patients with a dysregulated uh, glucose uh, management, mm -hmm. and uh, patients with radiation therapy. And the idea is when you have a clean surgical wound and you close it and you place negative pressure therapy on it, it can help in preventing uh, uh, wound dehiscence and superficial wound complications. And I will be talking about the evidence, but even more importantly, what patients should be considered for this therapy and what should you take into your consideration. Because it's not an easy, uh, uh, it's a very cheap therapy, but it can be effective. Mm -hmm. And is this something that you're using on all or uh, uh, any of your patients, Dr. Kieser? Well, we have not used it prophylactically, and mm -hmm. I think this is a brilliant idea. VAC or uh, negative pressure wound therapy has revolutionized the treatment mm -hmm. of wound uh, wound uh, care management. It's amazing how even this, even our patients with the smallest little infection will get a vac on it because it heals it so much more quickly. So mm -hmm. I think this is very exciting what you're doing, Richard. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, as you say, picking the right patients so that we don't cost, mm -hmm. uh, put the cost up like crazy. Now, not everybody needs it, but those that need it really need it. Yeah. And if I could just ask a very basic question that I think the audience would be interested in. How do you manage standard wounds? What is your routine for an uncomplicated patient? How would they be managed? How 
How long would they be dressed? Would they only use chlorhexidine? How often would that happen? I'm very interested of all, all of you to provide that information. So, uh, so all patients get, uh, during the day of surgery, three times a, 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 a gift of uh, cefisolin. I don't know whether that's the right way to say it. So that's the antibiotic treatment we Correct. give to all our patients uh, who undergo cardiac surgery. And then we, uh, uh, on the sterile field, when the wound is closed, there's a bandage place and that's left uh, on site for at least 24 hours and okay. preferably for 48 hours. And after that, we don't do anything with the wound. Okay, mm -hmm. that sounds similar to our practice. We, we changed our wound care protocol to an aseptic technique in 2008. And, as one, and also we changed the, from betadine to chlorhexidine at that time. We had a dramatic reduction in all wound infections, all serious wound infections in our group. And the, the wound care protocol is a sterile protocol. Uh, the, dress, the dressing obviously gets applied to the surgery. It's, it is changed uh, probably daily or if it's soaking or whatever, but uh, it is done sterilely and it is kept on until all the lines are out. In other words, all the ECG oh. lines are crossing over the wound or whatever, and we found that this also really helps. Interesting. And then when the lines are out, then it can be left off open to air. Mm -hmm. I think the, the issue that you're talking about with ECG leads in the States, there's a lot of disposable ECG leads, single patient use. But still, I wonder how clean they are. After e about five seconds exactly, out of the box. Exactly, exactly. And Melissa, could you talk to us about how you manage wounds standardly? So for dressings, we leave our wounds covered up to 14 days or the day of discharge, so that's usually around day seven. For high risk patients, so that is patients with poorly controlled diabetes, high BMI, female gender, um, we do have a targeted approach with the negative pressure therapy, mm -hmm. and we found that this, that's made a significant improvement mm -hmm. in, that, in that subpopulation affecting approximately 8% of our patients, but those patients would drive our SSI rate. Mm. So you would use it prophylactically? We would do oh, on clean, closed surgical wounds, placed at theater level, okay. uh, and then kept on up to seven days. Yeah, our, I think our, our routine in the States typically is addressing for 24 to 48 hours in an uncomplicated patient, yep. and we've definitely made the switch to chlorhexidine. Mm -hmm. um, so let's suggest that something has gone wrong and there is an infection. Um, so then you're talking about a surveillance program, and I'm very intrigued by how that might work. So we uh, follow the Public Health England protocol, which is based on the CDC definitions and classifications. Um, we monitor our patients in the inpatient uh, setting, as well as readmissions. And that's done prospectively. So we visit the wards, we check the microbiology results. Uh, a lot of work is done really about the early detection of SSI, because we feel that if you detect an SSI, you know, in its early state, it's easier to prevent or sort of reduce its severity or duration of that wound infection. Mm -hmm. So we would look at introducing an antimicrobial dressing early if there was an issue, uh, and certainly revisiting uh, antimicrobial washes for patients who mm -hmm. still have wounds healing mm -hmm. um, if they look like they're starting to show evidence. Mm -hmm. And I'm intrigued by the fact that the family would be part of the team uh, being given a photograph. And, and how do families react to this? Is it uh, something that they find reassuring or frightening? The, the <laughs> feedback from uh, the anonymized postal questionnaire has been overwhelmingly positive. Fantastic. Patients ha um, overall report that, the, and their families report that this gives them confidence in caring for their wound. It offers them reassurance. Mm -hmm. And there is a small subgroup that has used the photo to prompt early review with their GP or practice nurse as well. So it's worked very good feedback. And in a less formal way, have you found that patients send you photos of their wounds when they're concerned? Uh, doctors sometimes do. Oh, <laughs> you know? oh okay. So it's usually at the stage where you don't want to see it. Yeah. So I think this is brilliant, uh, mm -hmm. Melissa. It really is. I think it's really important to invoke patient responsibility. Uh, one of the things that I do as a preventive measure, I make sure they try to stop them smoking. I talk to them about um, sternal precautions. I even demonstrate for them, say, this is how I want you to do this. I want this to be automatic. This is, if you go home now, practice on your be own bed, get out of bed without using your arms, because right now, if you fall, your chest isn't cut. And I want this to be so automatic. And I, I rarely rewire a sternum because these patients know what to do. You know, it's just, and the diabetes, the patients with the diabetes, I always ask them, do you uh, measure your own sugars? And if they don't, I gently, urge them to do this because mm -hmm. this is patient responsibility and it's just as much a part of the problem uh, of the uh, healing as it is of what our part is. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. One of the things we've really worked on is patients when they're coughing and moving to protect themselves so they're not putting that wound stress on there. It's not like I'm broken, fix me. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, Richard, can you talk about how you came about using the negative pressure therapy? Was it something that you did as a small on a small scale as a trial, or did you really look at using this, uh, um, you know, more widespread based on some internal data, or how did you come to this? We started with the idea about uh, five, six years ago, and it was uh, you, you saw it emerging in different fields. In the field of orthopedics, it has been quite well proven. In the cardiothoracic field, it's still uh, without sound scientific evidence, but in the uh, orthopedics field, there is good scientific evidence that it helps. And in the same time, uh, we met a surgeon from Ananda Center who did it in his reconstructive surgery. So patients with a, with a uh, mediastinitis, with a large wound, and he, did a, uh, he, uh, he closed the wound after a couple of weeks, and then he would place, uh, uh, he called it a harness over it. Mm -hmm. So, and the whole idea was typically to give it strength, so that automatism to do like this, mm. then use your VEC system because it also will give some stability to that area. Right. And, it, and he had some very, very nice results. And the, w the first thing you notice when you use a system like that is you don't have the edema when you take it off. So you can see exactly where it is, where it has been. And that's the, one of the most important things. You have a reduction of edema and fluids. And we all know that bacteria love fluids mm -hmm. because there are a lot of uh, 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 substances in there they can use to grow. And the other important thing is, and that is also what uh, Melissa is talking about, is reduction of lateral forces. You can imagine in uh, the extreme obese patients, but also in female patients, that there's a lot of la lateral tension on the wound, mm -hmm. and that will cause some ischemia between the stitches. And when you use negative pressure therapy on a clean closed wound, you reduce the amount of lateral tension, uh, and, and in that way uh, enhance the blood flow through that area, reducing the chance of an infection. I think that is one of the ideas we really liked when we started thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, there was a large uh, international European group formed that made some guidelines for the cardiothoracic uh, community, in which I was honored to be a, a part of. And after that, we did some studies and things like that. How long do you keep it on after surgery? At least five days, and preferably uh, seven days. You can even keep it on longer than that okay. if, you, if you would okay. like. Okay, yeah, you. but at least five days. And okay. that's for most surgeons is a challenge. <laughs> Leave yes. it, leave it, leaving a dressing room for five days and not being able to look under it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that, I mean, that must dramatically change the way these wounds look because I'm oh, used yeah. to seeing them quite edematous. Yeah. And, you know, that wow. seems to be the norm. Um, you know, not erythematous but just very yeah. swollen and over time that goes down so I'm, I'm you know be very interested in hearing your data and more about this today mm -hmm. and I absolutely agree it's the layers we all know that you know it's not one thing that causes a problem it's multiple things mm -hmm. um, so before we close is there anything else that we can do from a surgeon's perspective um, you know there's a lot of hands touching these wounds after mm -hmm. the fact and uh, you have any you know words of wisdom in terms of how we can do better to uh, maintain these wounds in, a, in an optimal environment. Mm, I, think for, uh, I think for surgeons, I think it's really important that you're vigilant and you're observant. And if you see a trend, you need to address this. You should look at your own work and be your, your own first critic before somebody else does. And find out what you, this is what I did and mm -hmm. I changed it to uh, black and white, so. Do you, do you, can, can I ask you something? Do you have a feedback loop? So when you have infections, do you get feedback from a microbiologist or from a, um, well, a we, quality we advisor? Used to, we used to get a list of all our infections. Um, touch, touch wood, I haven't had any list yet because I've, yeah. I've addressed You're this problem. Pretty much at zero. Yeah, but um, I think, uh, I, I just think you, you, can, you can get to zero, but you just have to be mindful and vigilant. You have to care mm -hmm. to do this and not just let, you know, I, I, I think I hardly ever let a resident close because closing and opening is extremely important. You've got to stay in the middle. No paramedian and surgeons in cardiac surgery. We're not general surgeons. So uh, things like this, these little attention detail, when you're teaching mm -hmm. residents, you've got to instill this into them as well, how important this is. That's very exciting. And um, uh, again, before we leave, I'd like to know what you think we can do optimally for the average patient uh, to make sure they're empowered to take care of themselves when they leave the hospital. I think uh, the discussion here has pointed to the, the good advice on sternal protective movements. I would add support wear to that for your female patient. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage centres to look at the photo at discharge scheme. Oh. Uh, it's had a tremendous impact on our experience and patients and carers seem to have really enjoy it. So.
I'm really looking forward to hearing more about it. Now, in the States, we, we tend to have patients that go back to the same, stay with the same physician. They don't tend to go out too far in the community because we have so many centers mm -hmm. in the States that practice. But we do have short lengths of stay. Patients are out of the hospital in four or five days. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that follow-up is sometimes not as optimal as we would like. Mm -hmm. Clearly, if we can detect these issues early, before they get bad, mm -hmm. uh, we have our optimum chance. Of, of taking care of things. And so, you know, I think your, out, your outreach and your contact with the patient when, the le when they leave the facility is gonna be absolutely critical to these positive outcomes. Um, so I, I am delighted to hear more from all of you later on this afternoon. Uh, this is gonna be an exciting session. I think wound management is absolutely critical to every patient that we care for. Uh, is there anything else anybody would like to add in, uh, for our audience? Um, before we close. Uh, last thing I would like to say, wound problems shouldn't be the stiff child of car cardiothoracic surgery. It's something we all should have an interest in. The surgeons should have, a, have an interest in it, but also the nurses, and we should advise patients and make sure that they understand how important it is to come back to us and not go to a GP or go to a general surgeon when they have a problem. I think Thank that's you. the last important I remark. I absolutely agree. I, I think there's a before, there's a during, and there's an after, and they all need equal addressing. Thank you, very, very well said. Yeah, I agree with both those points. Well, well said. Mm -hmm. And um, again, we are just delighted to have you all here. Uh, this meeting provides an opportunity for people to come together from an international perspective, learn how we can optimize the care okay, of our patients. Yes. And one of the things that's so exciting is to use this medium and these roundtables so that people who can't be here today can learn from your wisdom and get excited about the things that you'll be discussing today. So without further ado, I thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much for your attention and enjoy your stay in Vienna. Delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.